So yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to um, Genesis Block, obviously, for hosting us tonight. This is a really nice venue here. Um, so I actually flew in a few hours ago from uh, County Cork in uh, the lovely Emerald Isle of Ireland. It's, uh, it's quite significant for me to be giving a presentation on Hennessy Road. Uh, I don't know if many of you understand the, the history of Hennessy Road. It's named after John Pope Hennessy from the lovely County Cork. He was the ninth governor of uh, Hong Kong, if anybody knows your history. And uh, he was significant for the history of Hong Kong because he lifted the ban on Chinese uh, who were considered second-class citizens by the British to actually invest and to buy land. So it was the idea of land ownership extended as a right uh, to Chinese people, which, led, which actually led to the boom, uh, which is known as Wan Chai in central Hong Kong today. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 not, it's very significant to be here for me. Um, these are the types of things that go through my mind on a daily basis. Uh, I'm very interested in philosophy. When I first came across blockchain, it was during my studies as a philosophy student in Cork. Um, and instead of trying to give a technical presentation, I want to give you, bring you through a, maybe a conscious shift for a moment to think about like what all this means. And um, hopefully, these slides should work. So I'm CEO of a company called Festi, and instead of boring you with the details about this payments company, uh, which, which might be interesting towards the end, once you understand why we're doing this. Um, I came across this uh, pretty cool uh, artist recently um, called Pavel Antemer. He's a Polish artist, and in 2008, he brought a bunch of Polish people from his neighborhood in Warsaw. He dressed them up um, in golden astronaut uniforms and he brought them around the world to travel. And what he was trying to display was uh, the socialist movement or communist movement which moved into a capitalist regime um, and how people here could not normally afford to travel the West, but actually they were able to travel because he saw these people as currency. And so that's one of the thoughts I want to leave you with today and on the beginning of this talk. We're all currency. And what does that mean? Well, you've seen a very, very well articulated presentation by Roger earlier, who I'm quite fond of the data protocol, and um, he's, I suppose, building something like data to understand as, a, as, as, as currency, and that's maybe a little hint as to where I'm going with this. Um, so yeah, you could imagine these like uh, quite young, hip, uh, ravages, uh, young people traveling the world for free, but they weren't doing it for free, of course, they were actually contributing, as they are themselves, a living, breathing, golden currency. Uh, I think this picture was actually held, was taken in Berlin, uh, or at least I like to think so, if anybody's ever been to Berlin. So, um, a human currency. There's like so many questions as to a human currency. I love questions. Uh, so, where does the value of a human currency come from? Oh, that's our ravers. Uh, where does the value of a human currency come from? To whom is a currency based on a human valuable to? Who produces this currency? Who is the consumer? These are basic economic questions that I think everybody should answer or should ask, especially with you know tokenizing everything at the moment. So, uh, one answer that I found was based on uh, Foucault, uh, his human capital. Uh, Foucault was French philosopher from the 19th century. Um, instead of boring you too many details about about him, he basically looked at this idea. And there was a shift from economics into um, rational economics. So he believed that a human capital, a human is built up of experiences and education. These experiences and education give them better decision-making power. And this decision-making power is what drives a rational e economy. Uh, this idea was basically held by a long, long time. This is an, uh, a Scottish philosopher named Adam Smith. He came up with free market uh, capitalism, which I'm, I'm sure everybody here probably in some way interacts with. So human capital for Adam Smith um, is the acquisition of dot, 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 talents during education, study, or apprenticeship. Costs a real expense. So there's actu an actual cost behind this experience, which is a capital in a person. Those talents are part of his fortune, and likewise, that of society. Um, this is his uh, spinning top here, which is a monument based after Adam Smith. So it's an interesting way of thinking about it, right? I don't think it's a complete picture but it says to help you on a train of thought of human currency as basically this thing that is invested on by parents, by our education systems, by our governments. So we are valuable in and of ourselves, okay? 
crazy, but true. Um, so taking this idea further, um, we, I kind of like to think of data as uh, you know our problem with rubbish. We, uh, it's completely inefficient. We have absolutely no idea where it goes. Um, and by the time we realize that this is a problem, it's always a little bit too late, um, too little and too late. So uh, that's why I, I really think it's interesting to be around uh, certain people who are working in this, in this industry of blockchain to, uh, to, to, to look at the question of data. And that's kind of where, um, where it led me in my, in my thought experiment when I was thinking about this is, well, human currency today, in the 21st century, with the invention of blockchain as a result of Satoshi Nakamoto and many more cryptographers that came before those uh, conglomerate of people, um, it's understood as data. So we accumulate data at an exponential rate. Roger gave you the figures earlier. I need not to talk about this in too much detail, but uh, that is essentially what we are. We are data creating human currency. Great. Where do I cash in? Maybe on datum. That's one way. Uh, but actually, someone else is more than likely profiting from your data, your currency. They're spending it, they're trading it, they're using it, they're watching it. And um, that causes maybe a bit of a problem for some people. I, I expect it should, because that ownership actually belongs to you. And I believe with the invention of blockchain technology, we can begin to think about how valuable we actually are and monetize that data. So about two years ago, um, I came up with this product called Festi. So what is Festi? Uh, Festi began as a pretty simple idea, getting payments into people's hands. This is one of the wristbands that we use. Uh, we use this at music festivals mostly, like that we did the largest music festival in Ireland last year, named Electric Picnic. It's one of the, one of the largest festivals in Western Europe. And we allowed staff members to purchase uh, food with their tokens. Uh, so I was just tokenizing the idea of food vouchers, basically. Um, so that got a bit boring, and we thought, okay, how, how do we take this a little bit further? Like, what's the real problem? Well, the real problem is actually insights, data. What, how, do we, how do we understand this data and information? And how do we truly own it, and how do we sell it, and how do we trade it? Or if we don't want to sell it or trade it, how do we keep it as our own? So bringing it from a kind of one-tap solution where you can tap, you have your cryptocurrency card, you can load various different cryptocurrencies on it, right? We're not trying to be another cryptocurrency. There's many great ones out there already, uh, you know, like Bitcoin or whatever. So we allow people to be able to use this in a real life. It's not just about cryptocurrencies though, because if you talk to the 99% of the rest of the world, um, they're not using it. They're not using it in a day-to-day -day capacity. Like I'd like to think that most people here um, if you know or understand cryptocurrency, you believe in its utility and you are using it on a day-to-day -day basis and that you have at least 99% of your capital in cryptocurrency um, uh, or at least a stable currency if you're uh, like, like die if, you're, if, you, if you don't like the volatility. And actually that is a major thing that we found was the st stability of currencies when we um, talk to these merchants and uh, you know, it's actually not very hard to convince a merchant to move on to anything. You, you know, you could tell them to accept magic beans if they thought that people were using magic beans and it was a legitimate payment method for them to accept but when they fluctuate at such a high velocity as like cryptocurrency it's, it can be a bit difficult so that's where I'm very interested in the die coin and uh, definitely think there's a, a very bright future for B2B for a, a, a stable cryptocurrency such as that. Um, so these are some of the problems and some of the issues that we bumped into along the way and then we basically discovered okay actually what we're kind of coming out here, what we're interested in is, is, is the insights and data around um, what people are spending, say at a music festival for example, there's no real way or technology that allows you to understand where people are, that can be a troublesome when you're trying to figure out where the ambulance is or how you get an ambulance through a crowd of people, so I myself am an ambulance driver at some of these music festivals and I take care of people just before they fatally overdose and hopefully they don't, but we have to deal with getting through a crowd of 10 or 20,000 people um, where we don't know at what time and in, in, the, in the live scenario when a concert is going to finish and these swarm of, it's like fish, swim, if you've ever gone snorkeling, coming against you and you're trying to drive someone who's like puking beside you on top of you and you're like, Jesus. And so then you go out of the gate and it's like, okay, show me your ticket. 
And it's like, fuck off. Like, it's like, are you serious? And so you're tapping your ticket, and they use RFID technology, which, um, you know, fair enough, but it, it, a lot of it is QR code based still. And QR code is quite familiar, I think, with a lot of Asian uh, communities here for payments. Uh, but for ticketing, like, in a live environment, it, it, it kind of sucks. So you might spend like five or six times trying to tap, and then you got to grab his wrist and tap it five or six times, and then you get to leave the gate and get him into a real ambulance and let me go back into the music festival and take care of more people. So um, these, this was kind of a big thing that we wanted, was to introduce technology into uh, music festivals, events, merchants, point of sale terminals, um, and really begin to understand loyalty, uh, begin to understand uh, merchant um, capabilities, such as purchasing power, ticketing, um, a few other things here, access control and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like data insights is a big thing that we're building at the moment. This is just a demo that we did at a music venue in, uh, in Cork City recently, where we integrated our point of sale system, and there was maybe about 60 people that were given a wristband on the way in. They could download the app, they could load a cryptocurrency. Uh, there was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dash at the time, but we've extended beyond, way beyond this. They could also just put in with their normal currency if they wanted. Um, and that kind of begged the question as to, okay, well, why would a consumer want to opt into this system? Right? We've understood it from the festival, we've understood it from the merchant, right? They want insights, they want analytics, they want a more robust, efficient system. Um, and so for the consumer, well, actually, they're already tapping a card. That card is centralized, that card belongs to the bank, that card is selling your data to insurance companies, and those insurance companies are affecting your premiums based on your spending power. If you, if you purchase alcohol, unfortunately, that will give you a negative rating. If you eat steak dinners, that will give you a negative rating. If you're French and you like a lot of cheese, that will give you a negative rating because these all uh, supposedly, uh, you know, may be negative behaviors or negative uh, consumptions based on your health. So when we looked at some focus groups who are uh, in, in Ireland who are being questioned about like, what do you think about these cards that these contactless uh, Visa cards, MasterCards, every single person here has one. What do you think about this card and uh, did, are you aware? The reason why it's free to tap and so convenient is because you yourself are data, you yourself are a currency, but we own it. Well, the kids were absolutely fucking terrified and the, the focus groups don't really uh, achieve many good results. And uh, that's a big problem for, 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 for everyone, I think, here in this room to understand that every time you tap a card, that, data is being traded without, maybe maybe with your consent, you probably tick the box somewhere. Um, so that's a big problem. Um, just to kind of understand the, the product side a little bit, um, I kind of promised I wouldn't go too much into this because I, I don't like to really give the same presentation twice, I like to keep it like a bit fresh. So, but just so you can understand it here from the product side. So we have an app, you can activate your wristband if you arrive at a music festival. Ideally, you've gotten this wristband before the music festival, like we send it out to you if we have a partnership with the event or with the, with the organizer of the festival. Um, you can top it up using your fiat currency, using your, you know, your, your, your cryptocurrency, of course, if you, if you so wish. And uh, we have a number of other products, so it's like generally wearables, so you can imagine this in like, for the women, it's like in your spa, so if you're in a spa or you're in like the, some, some of these places around like Hong Kong, for example, you just have your wristband and it, it, it tracks how much like your movement, your, your spending, your, uh, you know, you might, be, you might go to the restaurant or something like that. Uh, you can imagine there's an everyday payments card, the same way as your MasterCard or something like that. You could, um, I remember I was talking to Martin about his ATM, he didn't realize the ATM in the corner, which if you're looking for cryptocurrency tonight, probably it works. Um, they, they, that actually accepts an NSC, you can actually tap a, uh, one of these cards against that and you can actually load your cards with that. So you can imagine a club having a branded card or you can imagine their membership card having one of these. Um, so, you know, you, there's many, many utilities. You know, I was in an airline earlier, you can imagine uh, using this for lounge access or something like that as well. So many, many different types of utility for making wearable technology like a convenient way to spend your cryptocurrency, uh, but much beyond that, it's, uh, you know, respecting the likes of Datum and DiCoin to understand, well, what do merchants want and what do consumers want? Um, overall, that's kind of like what we're doing. Um, I guess, yeah, like, uh, look into the Altamer, I think he's a very interesting artist, and like, like him, he questioned assumptions that were made in society. The assumptions made by Foucault and the assumptions made by Adam Smith is that we live in a rational economy. We absolutely do not. We live in a very bizarre world. Uh, little of it is understood. 
but when you actually get to have some real insight and you directly purchase data directly from someone and they have sold it to you, you can guarantee that that data is genuine and you're eliminating the global market of stolen data and you're beginning to understand what consumer trends are for the first time we can understand what the market is. So that's generally what cryptocurrency or what blockchain means to me. Um, I hope to see you guys at Ethis tomorrow or something, and uh, we'll be in Hong Kong until Sunday. If anybody wants to hang out or do something, please. Uh, I love Hennessy Road and want to understand a little bit more about the history here. And yeah, please say hi. Thanks very much. Thanks, Graham. For the insightful uh, session on how human and the future of currency, I'm going to invite the speakers back up for a Q and A session. So, Chow and Roger, please. And Graham. So, who wants to, who wants to start off? Questions? Actually, I want to ask Chow about the pie. So, um, so um, how does a regular user profit from a die? So, from my understanding, you're packing USD with collateral, with a diversified um, assets. And so how, how does a regular user like myself profit from your cryptocurrency? Cool. So uh, that's, that's a really good question. So first, I'll, I'll give the current, the answer to the current version that is, is just it's all value and you can have the DAI, it's all value and the probably alternative USDT. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, we're launching the multi-cloud DAI. And in the multi-cloud DAI, we're actually adding a new feature. It's called DAI Reward. Basically, it means you can earn interest from holding, from locking DAI into a contract. You're earning in interest from that. Uh, currently, we are, we're, we're thinking about to set the interest rate at 2%, which means that you can gain the annual interest from, from holding DAI. Uh, so that would uh, add an advantage to DAI comparing with USDT and other stable coin. Um, yeah. Well, um, uh, well follow-up question is because um, you're basically you're packing the, the backup currency. You're basically acting like a central bank, right? Uh, sort of, and uh, you have smart contracts to back that up. So how how do you procure that into like like how do you, how does it work? It's more technical, but how does how does like smart contract in the uh, How does the smart contract work? Yeah, yeah. In uh, the, in, no, no, no. I understand how it works, but uh, it, no, not not exactly, but. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, how how does it back how, how does it back up the uh, value of die? You use a smart contract on the Ethereum to back up your your currency, but like how, how does it work? Like why why would people like are you paying for it or how does it work? Uh, we uh, okay so let's have a session on how to write smart contract now. Um, <laughs> okay so so works. What, so the smart contract is it's just a bunch of contracts. People call it smart, but it's actually not smart. It's quite dumb at current state. Uh, okay, so I will, I will not say that on tomorrow's <laughs> event. Uh, okay, so what, what basically is that uh, you just send, you, you can think, you, you just, you don't need to think about a smart contract. You think that you just pull your collateral and store it in a place that everyone can see it, and uh, it's got locked, and it can only be locked. Uh, it, and the, the code is, is already written, and everyone knows the rules, and uh, it's just executed uh, automatically when a certain situation uh, triggered. Um, but I can talk with you more detail on how the flow works. Uh, yeah. it, it, there could be a situation where the contracts are counterfeit or uh, made up, right? It's possible. Yeah, it, it is possible. That is why the security of the contracts is extremely important for, uh, especially because it's written in Solidity, and Solidity is now very highly secure uh, program language. Uh, but but um, we, so we, we we are we have the best programmers, uh, uh, smart contract who who write the best smart contract we have. The auditing, security auditing, and also some delay, some 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 uh, settlement to deal with this uh, this hack. But that is a very uh, good point to mention that the security of the contract itself. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I have a, a question for Graham. Well, forgive, forgive me because I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Um, when I see your presentation, um, my question is if an investor uh, comes to you and challenges you on uh, what do you do if a uh, company like Revolut or N26 goes in and does the same thing with all the resources, how would you respond to that? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So if you look at the company behind Revolut, uh, it's called Paysafe Card. Paysafe Card were basically started as a voucher company based in the UK. Um, I was actually one of the first people that allowed the exchange between Paysafe Card and Bitcoin back in 2012. Um, and yeah, like what we found the uh, problems of it, like as a centralized company, is that it relies on the MasterCard network. When you rely on a MasterCard network, well, they take the fees. You don't take the fees. We want this to be a fee-free transaction, or at least low, like Bitcoin or like Ethereum or something like that. Like it's not about charging uh, merchants 2.75 percent on every transaction that they make, or a taxi driver when they're tapping your card against their um, little point of sale terminal, which a lot of taxis are now getting into. That's crippling for young businesses, uh, for small enterprises. That that like 2.75 percent is their profit margin, maybe that, like the salary of one of their of one of their employees. So how how do they wish to scale their business when they rely on a centralized banking point of sale terminal that's used on any one of them, Mastercard, Revolut, name any of them? Um, again, the easiest sell for me has been going to merchants and actually explaining this to them. Um, but then you know they have the problems of volatility and all the other likes that we're you know, trying to work with other people to solve. Um, so it's it's not much of a not much of an issue to be honest. But a good question. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, in terms of uh, the analytics that you're able to uh, uh, provide, and you showed a quick uh, picture, um, I mean, can you just dive a little bit deeper into what kind of analytics you, you can provide, and in terms of what kind of analysis um, maybe we can maybe extrapolate out of that for our more day-to-day -day lives, like, you know, went to 7-Eleven, went to gas station, and how I can really, uh, you know, put together analysis on that in real time and get it on my app, on my iPhone, or something like that. Yeah, sure. Um, I could speak more from, like, the festival or event side, as that's more my area. And on that side, it's really thinking of it like a heat map. So you come to a field, like a greenfield site, it might be 20 acres in, in, in size, so it's quite large. And you're the organizer of this festival, and you have rented out a portion of land for Heineken, a portion of land for Budweiser, and a portion of land for hot dogs. Um, these are cash-based uh, merchants. They're there on site for five days or so, and they're at the end of the day telling you how much that they uh, accumulated in, in sales. And you, as a festival owner, you're, you're acquiring like a percentage of those sales. Um, how do you trust Budweiser, Heineken, or the hot dog guy? Uh, for telling the truth, first of all. Second of all, how do you value each section of your piece of land uh, in your festival as to where is the biggest spending power going to happen? Is it going to be in this corner or this corner? Am I, am I charging too much or too little for these big companies coming in here? Um, that's like just a small bit on the data analytics on the festival side. On a day-to-day, -day, you could imagine this like you would already, any kind of loyalty card or loyalty membership thing that you probably already have. Um, I know like some of these clothes shops, even on this street or in a shopping area in Kowloon, you can, you know, say H&M, you can probably get like one of these loyalty cards and you, you give up your date of birth, you give up your address, you give up your location. Um, they're going to know all these different things and then they're going to be able to say, okay, on your birthday we'll give you a free whatever. What they're trying to do there is to try to get you back and try to keep you loyal. But maybe as a member you're not really understanding um, at that point when you sign up or whatever that okay how is this being used or am I really in control of this so it's kind of shedding light on certain aspects of that like as a non-data scientist I can't go too much into like every data set that you know we could potentially do but you from a day to day we already have these cards it's just that they're used in a centralized manner question for Greg uh, how does the uh, uh, this device is it uh, is it paid or free for the user? If there's a transaction fees, uh, how does the business model work? How do you make money out of it? Sure, making money is a big thing for any company and any young startup business. So I absolutely have to consider that. Well, we are software as a service. We're not a hardware company, so we do not make money on the hardware that we sell. Rather, we believe in penetrating the market with more consumers and then basically allowing those consumers and facilitating that transactional uh, data transaction between merchants, marketing agencies, and consumers and taking a cut from, that faci from facilitating that transaction. We sell um, 
basically subscription packages to merchants so that they can have these deep analytic insights on a monthly basis, and that's our, that's our revenue model. In terms of hardware, these things cost if, like not that much. Like they're, I wouldn't be giving too much away of my business model by telling you, because I don't make money off them. Uh, getting them onto people's wrists, that's up to the event. So you're going to a music festival, you have 100,000 people. Say I'm going to Ultra Taiwan on Sunday. Uh, Ultra Taiwan of 35,000 people. Um, they have to put this wristband on their wrists to know that they have actually purchased that ticket. So that's automatically getting it into consumers' hands. On the card then itself, we what we call it is like a community DNA. So instead of trying to take over the entire market, um, we look at a niche and we f we follow who is a festi, who is someone that is like young or smart enough to understand cryptocurrency, understand that they want to own their data, even understand like that's a small percentage of people. But who are these people? They're the types of people that go to music festivals. They're the types of people that hang out in in hipster cafes, in vinyl record stores. Um, in bars that uh, brew their own beer, uh, the, uh, the gin bars, which is very popular in vogue at the moment. So um, that's very much our demographic. So we go to these places and we integrate our point of sale system there and we say, okay, we give X amount of cards so that you can distribute, you are now a distribution center for us. Um, so you can freely give out these cards to your members, to your customers. And the merchant is already paying us a subscription fee, so that's already subsidizing the cost of doing that distribution. Instead of being a B2C, uh, like some of these companies where they're selling the cards for, I've seen a South Korean company charge $80 for what essentially costs $4. I'm not gonna be lied to you, like that's how much it costs. Um, so what, you know, why do that? Why close it off to a market of crypto rich bros? Why not get it out there to the, to the real people? Um, and that you have to do it for very cheap or free. One last question, is it one time use or is that it can be used for uh, repeat purposes, like each merchant has to ship it to the customer or uh, one so time? No, so you can just download the app and you can activate your card. We actually want these, we want people to have as many of these as possible, so you can imagine a music festival, people actually collect these wristbands, so you know a lot of people back home, like they might have their whole wrist covered by the summer because they've gone to all these music festivals, and these are souvenirs. When you look at the cards, well, you know, you, you already have a wallet full of cards at the moment. You have membership cards, you have loyalty cards, you have airline cards, you have credit cards. Um, you know, there's no limit to how many of these that you, you know, that you can have on Festi. You can just activate it or deactivate it on the app at any time. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, I want to bring this one back, Chow. Um, so maybe this is just a concept that I'm not familiar with. I saw a slide about an arbitrage bot. Uh, can you go in more into detail about how that works? Okay, so the ar arbitrage part. So basically you can buy others Ethereum that being locked at a cheaper price. So we have a, we set a, a, a price fee that is lower than the current, 3% uh, uh, lower than the current market price. So. So what happens is that if the price of Ethereum drop below the 150 ratio, that his collateral will be unlocked. So that everyone need, so he, he already borrowed some, some portion of the die of the system. That's why if the, the ratio dropped to 150 percent, that his collateral is at risk and uh, his collateral get unlocked. So everyone who can interact with the Web3 or using the broader, uh, you can just repay his debt, or is it die, repay his debt, and you can free his proportion of the Ethereum um, at 3% discount uh, according to his uh, debt, and the remaining uh, will go back to the, to the, to the owner plus uh, minus a penalty fee. Uh, is that clear? Probably not. Um, yeah, so I better find a better way to explain the, the process, but basically is that how, how does this arbitrage option happen? Is that uh, when someone's collateral just goes risky, that he has an outstanding debt and no one is paying it, and you go and you pay, help him to pay back his debt, and uh, you get his collateral at cheaper price at 3%. So that is that get canceled out in the system. Um, and uh, for you, it's like a, a bonus for you in sacrifice for his own uh, a proportion of his asset because he couldn't pay back his debt uh, in time. Uh, that is 
the, the, the process. Or I can show you later how the process works on the, on the interface. All right, dope, I'm down. Uh, for Chow? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, just curious, because we talked about arbitrage and maybe... Uh, seems like there's a lot of uh, other financial creative solutions. I'm just curious, um, do you ever get questions from, say, Hong Kong MA or SFC in terms of just being a money, like, like money service? Kind of thing. Is it falling into that or not yet? Uh, no, we have a legal opinion that that is not security, um, and we're working with uh, the, the best legal uh, firms in U.S. and trying to get DAI as legit as possible, as yeah. legal compliant as possible. Um, not not just on the security side because I see that that part, mm. but I guess because um, you do the credit part yeah. as well, right? So that's. Separate from whether this is security or not, then there could be. Yeah, cool. So you can you can think about Dai currently as a shadow bank, um, mm. right? Yeah. And uh, you can just uh, do the analogy of how the government should regulate the shadow bank, yeah. and that works the same way as Dai. Um, I'm curious though, which regulator are you going under? Like, because I know with all this, this is all global, all internet and stuff, right? So yeah, so we have a major office in the U.S. and we are uh, we, we are primarily. Uh, uh, trying to get a legal opinion in the U.S. Uh, and of course, in other country, and, um, Europe, etc. But uh, once you get uh, uh, legal opinion in the U.S., which, that is that will be the strongest. Yes. Right? So. Thank you. I have a question for Roger. So going forward, uh, how do you plan on like acquiring data from like Facebook and Google? Because I would assume that those are the main like emulators of data. So um, yeah, so that's never going to happen. Um, and the reason is simply that Facebook and Google will protect this data at all costs, right? And actually, as a developer, you're not allowed to take any data out of Facebook and put it anywhere, right? So this notion that that someone else can build a business with Facebook's data that will never happen. Um, what we focus on is enabling developers to build their own services and apps, right? They collect their own first-party data and then making that data valuable. And so the next things that we focus on is that you can, for example, link your Coinbase account, you can link your My uh, Ether Wallet account. This is first-party data that no one else has. Right? No ad network knows your balance on Coinbase. But this would be super valuable to an advertiser. And if we can give you a way that you can securely put the balance of your Coinbase account right into our system, and we can anonymize that data, we can use zero knowledge proofs, whatever, right? So that an advertiser can basically be certain that if he wants to advertise to people that have at least 10 Bitcoin, he can do that through our platform. That is the most valuable sort of first party data that no one else has. And you will never log in with Facebook to your bank. Right? Maybe to Revolut, actually. <laughs> so, maybe I'm wrong on that. But currently, the mass market will not use Facebook to log into the bank, right? But we think the system that we're building has enough trust embedded on a technical level, right? You don't need to trust us. Um, we don't have access to data. You don't have to trust the developer. That you will be comfortable putting really sensitive data in there. And if that data is obfuscated uh, enough or using zero knowledge proofs that you can prove a certain fact without disclosing the actual data, um, then yeah, we think we will be able to get extremely sensitive data into this system. And that is way more valuable than kind of, you know, some of the stuff that Facebook and, and Google have. Yeah. Uh, we can take a last question. Yeah. Um, based on what I understood from the process, I open an account on the website, I transfer the money to the account, then I'll get uh, $400 from the DAO, die, and then I can choose uh, what asset to buy, or yeah. it's already, uh, I have to, it's automatically uh, banking against uh, Ethereum or some other. Do I need to pick and choose uh, what, I, what I can do with the under die? So, uh, you, well, wherever there's a trading pair, you can just exchange die for other asset. So, uh, once you get 
So you're talking about you are. So there are two ways of having that. One is just exchange Ethereum, Bitcoin for that right. um, exchange, right? Is there's no borrowing or generation involved. Um, that is for the case. The second case is that if you want to leverage on your Ethereum, or if you want to have an extra uh, credit, liquidity currently. So that is how you just lock your Ethereum and you can issue DAI against it. That is basically a loan. Um, so, and the question is that how can, so DAI is ERC20 token. I don't have to be an account, so if I want to invest in the crypto, it seems like investment route. I open an account at your website and I put the money, I transfer $100, the, the fit money. Is that how it works? Uh, or there's the role of uh, uh, US dollar, oh, any currency. Okay, so actually we don't have a, we don't have a website. We have an interface for the smart contract. Right. We build an interface, and everyone can build an uh, interface for the smart contract. Okay. So, and it is all on-chain, and it's all uh, 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 crypto asset or blockchain asset. Um, 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 all, all the transactions that is getting involved. There's no fiat currency involved. And how do you inject the fiat currency into the system is by having those other companies that provide this fiat to crypto reps so that you can uh, give your fiat to them and they give the DAI to you. But uh, the, right, that is how you enter okay. to, to get that. But if you already have Ethereum and other asset, you can just do the exchange um, on this, in the system. Oh. Yeah. Uh, sorry, well, last question then. Sure. Um, so ha is there a mechanism of regulating how much DAI you can issue? Because you, you're, obviously there's no limitation of, of cryptocurrency you can issue, right? So, so is there a mechanism? What kind of mechanism is that? Okay, so yeah, sure, is that so? there, there's a mechanism. That is what we call debt ceiling. That is it's debt ceiling. Debt ceiling, it's like, um, the, the debt ceiling, oh, that's the debt ceiling. Um, yeah. So there's a limit, uh, the absolute amount of DAI that you can issue? Yeah, there's, there's a limit amount of DAI you can issue against each collateral. So for each collateral, um, <coughs> the maker community decide what is the maximum amount you can issue from this certain collateral. Um, you guys are the majority holder of, of obviously, right? Uh, currently, yes, uh, but uh, it's all done by uh, decentralized voting. So we are actually going to have our first vote uh, on 12. Uh, this month, so every make, it's, it's not us. It depends on it's, it's, the power is go to the MKR holder. The you can provide this community. Uh, they can vote and to to direct the, the the decision. So it's not on our team itself. It's all down on chain voting, the governance structure. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, I think that's it. So we're gonna finish up and. Thanks, Genesis Block, uh, Winnie, Martin, and Dennis, wherever you are, for hosting us. <laughs> and Vesti for sponsoring the beers and pizza. Um, just one last announcement. This is our next event. It's in Korea, in Seoul. It's a product development conference uh, on blockchain technology. So we're still looking for more speakers and sponsors, but please, no ICOs and only if you have a product. Um, so yeah, I'll see you there.